The path to homeschooling for each of us comes out of our unique circumstances, often as a sense of God calling us to do that something greater for our children, and often contrary to our original plans. Today, you're in for a treat as we welcome homeschooling mom, Caitlin Zara, to talk about how she became the unexpected homeschooler. Welcome to Homeschooling Saints, the podcast that helps you create the homeschool you love for the people you love. Our host is Lisa Maladnik, a Catholic life coach, TV host, best-selling author, and an instructor at Homeschool Connections. Before we get started, remember to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the bell to join our channel. Hello and welcome. I'm Lisa Maladnik, your host, and today we're talking with Caitlin Zara about how she became the unexpected homeschooler. Caitlin Zara is the proud mother of two boys and wife to her husband, Joe. The affectionately self-proclaimed unexpected homeschooler found her way into this beautiful calling after earning degrees in childhood education and literacy and teaching public school in New York. Her God-given gift of inspiring, teaching, and nurturing children now shines through as she lovingly serves her family every day. Caitlin would love to hear from you. She can be reached at CaitlinZara at gmail.com, and that's spelled K-A-I-T-L-I-N-Z-A-R-A at gmail.com. Caitlin, thanks so much for making time in your busy day. It's so great to see you. It's so good to see you. I'm just excited. I've told you this many times <laughs> to have time with you, to have another conversation with you. So I am so excited for this time together. My goodness, you have a gift of joy, Caitlin, and, and I really hope the audience gets to feel that today um, because it really is needed. You know, our, our times require it. It's such a gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and I love that our topic today is about the unexpected. So step us into what that was like. You did not expect to homeschool. So what were your expectations? I didn't expect to homeschool. As a, a teacher myself, I, I say I closed the door and I created this world with my students. We read C.S. Lewis every year and we had this beautiful classroom experience together. And so I just assumed that that is what my sons would do as well, that I would send them to public school. We, my husband and I looked for a house in the best neighborhood that we could, actually in the district that I taught in. And it was never a thought in my mind that there could be a different way for us. And Ironically, I live two houses over from the public school my sons would have attended. And I guess we had this fantasy that we would walk them, you know, two houses down every day for school. And in truth, I really, like I said, Lisa, I never saw that there was another way. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because we all do have a lot of invisible kind of assumptions about our lives that have been given to us culturally, yeah. through the family, yes. all of those things. And you're a trained educator. And because I want to emphasize this because I don't know if people caught it. You weren't doing exactly what was expected of you in the public school. Let's be clear yes. about that. You yes. were closing the door to read C.S. Lewis to the yes. children. You were yes. doing something a little off the grid already. It's not that you were being defiant or breaking rules, but you were yeah. enriching your students in a very intentional way. So in this context, your expectations were that your sons would have beautiful, rich experiences. Absolutely. Yeah. And I went into the classroom ready to serve. And I always said to my students, I I've done all of the, the schoolwork, the higher education. I know how to teach you. I can teach math and reading and all those wonderful things. But whether I do or I don't, you're going to learn those things. And I needed to make them better people and try to teach them, I don't know, special life values that I thought were important. And I have stayed in touch with a number of those students. And it really was never about the math. It was never about the reading. It was all about the connection with students and, and giving them that, that special time. I don't know, trying to enrich their lives, make their lives more joyful and I certainly expected that that's just how every classroom would be and that my sons would experience that one day too. Yeah, yeah. And you probably knew lots of, and I do too, lots of teachers who are dedicated and genuinely totally. care about children, really, really good people out there and many good people of faith. But yes. but you had very clear frame a framework, a plan, right? You and your husband yeah. were at peace with your plan. You're excited about it. What caused you to surrender that plan? So when the time came where I had to register my son, my older son, Rocco, for kindergarten, I had really 
difficult decisions to make, especially health decisions for my sons. But also, we were just coming out of COVID lockdowns. Things that were being taught in schools were not aligned with my my moral compass, my Catholic faith. And I felt that I was so backed against a wall. I was going to have to move, relocate, do something drastic to really create the life that I wanted for my family. And when I thought about moving, which we did, it did not give me peace. It just didn't, it didn't feel right. I was so anxious. There were times, if you remember in movies, there's always a character that like wakes up out of bed and they they stand up and they're they're sweating from a nightmare. Like I remember waking up with that level of anxiety over, I can't go down the public school path. This isn't going to be right for my children. I don't feel like I want to move, but what else is there? There's homeschooling? No, that's going to be so weird. Again, for your <laughs> listeners, I know we have international listeners. Um, I live about 35 minutes outside of Manhattan to give context for your listeners about where I am. That The idea of homeschooling would just be so taboo and so odd. And I thought, well, my it's going to be so weird. And my son's not going to have any friends. And we're going to be those unsocialized homeschoolers, which now... It's crazy to me to think that way. I don't right. <laughs> and my anxiety, Lisa, got to a point where I was so physically almost paralyzed in that anxiety about this decision that I had to make for my family that that is when I had to turn it over to God and say, I've tried to figure this out on my own, foolishly, foolishly tried to figure it out and, and you know, research, but I need to explore this. And when I did, homeschooling was absolutely the answer that I was looking for. And I took a leap of faith, but I felt that that was, I don't know. It was, it was really what, it was what was meant for me. It was what God had intended for my family without a doubt. So Caitlin, you made this unexpected turn down this path to investigate homeschooling and you allowed the Holy Spirit to work in that. So just say a little bit to our audience, because this is an important part of your story about what prepared you to make that unexpected move. Absolutely. And that is, not only is it an important part, it is a def- it is the defining moment in my life, in my life. So I'm thrilled you asked and I get to share this story. Um, it's hard for me to talk about, so bear with me. Um, on March 5th, 2020, I had my second son, Romeo, and I went into the hospital at 38 weeks pregnant And I suffered a um, uterine rupture, which happens to 0.4% of women. And I always drive it home by saying, yeah, that's less than half of 1%. This is a very rare occurrence to have a uterine rupture. And when I went to the hospital with my husband, they checked me and they said, okay, baby head down, heartbeat is strong, get out of here, come back in a couple hours. And I looked at my husband, I said, I'm not leaving. I'm in tremendous pain, I'm not leaving. And we stayed in the cafeteria at the hospital in tremendous pain. And about an hour later, it was unbearable. And I went back up to triage. And at that time, they checked me out and immediately noticed that my son, there was no detectable heartbeat. And in that moment, chaos broke out. As you can imagine, in this little spot in triage, I was swarmed with doctors and nurses who were screaming. They were screaming. And I know most people say, like, that's not how doctors and nurses are trained to behave and how they usually, well, it was a very, very, it was an emergency situation, of course. And in that moment, I heard them talking about preparing the OR and about how they were going to put me under general anesthesia and I'd be asleep and they were going to try to save the baby and I. And... They wheeled me out very, very quickly. They did an incredible job of acting quickly. And as I was going down the hallway on my stretcher, I felt my husband pull away. I felt that they had said to, you know, I, I heard them say to him, you can't go with her. And I knew that I was kind of, I'm, I'm going in there on my own. I have no support system. And I was so peaceful. And I knew at that time exactly what was happening. I absolutely heard what they were saying. I knew, I knew how serious the situation was for my son and I. And that ride on the stretcher, the gurney from my, you know, triage spot to the, to the OR 
was so quick. And I just kept my eyes closed. And I heard them say that my son had two minutes of reserve, which I took to to mean that he had two minutes to survive. And in that moment, I closed my eyes and I said, I should start praying. Let me start praying. Well, Lisa, I couldn't think of a single prayer. And our father, like that was, I'm like, how does it even go? I couldn't think of anything in that moment. And I said, okay, then I'm just going to say, if you want to take me, you can, you can take me. And Lisa, I was 31 years old at this time. And I said, and if you want to take my son, who I wanted, who was more wanted than I could even describe to you, you can take him. And if you want to take us both, you can take us both. And I meant it with all of my heart and soul. And I saw my son, my son Rocco, and my husband's faces in my mind. And I said, Lord, you'll take care of them. They'll be okay. And at that moment, they busted through the doors of the OR and I heard them call one minute of reserve. And so I knew that my son had less than 60 seconds to survive. And again, I was so peaceful and calm. And everything happening around me was so physically painful. Everyone was, it was just rough, them trying to prepare me for for surgery. And they were working quickly. That's what they had to do. And I looked up at the anesthesiologist and I said, are you sure you have to put me to sleep? At that last moment, I was still trying to somehow advocate for myself and say, no, keep me awake. You can do this. And he screamed in my face. He looked at me and he said, no, we have to save your baby. And at that moment, I went completely to sleep. I fully intended when I went to sleep, I I really expected that my son would be stillborn or that perhaps I wouldn't wake up. And I, that last thought in my mind was really, you can take me, whatever is your will, you can do it. And I really felt that so strongly. And when I woke up, I was in recovery and I looked at my husband who was holding our baby and he was wrapped up and swaddled and he was not moving. He was not, you know, making any kind of crying or cooing. Um, And I looked at my husband and I said, oh, he's stillborn, isn't he? My husband jumped up and he said, no, he is perfect. I believe in APGAR scale is how they rate children's um vitals and and their color and their breathing after birth and they said he was a 9.9 out of 10 and we never give a 10 they said he he, he's perfect and my husband handed him to me and in that time lisa i'm i wish i could tell you that then i was continue i was calm and i was uh, you know no i was processing how absolutely traumatic what had just happened was i wasn't crying i wasn't screaming i was just it was all catching up to me And when I had a quiet moment with my husband, I asked him when it was just us, what happened? What happened to you? What was your take? How did you experience this? And he said to me, Caitlin, he said that he fell to the ground in the hallway and he was sobbing and they had to, I I say it with laughter, but they had to pick this grown man up because they said that they had never, the nurses later told me they'd never seen a husband so distraught at the idea of losing his his wife or child. And they put him in a janitor's closet to wait. That was the only room next to the OR. And during my surgery, which I have no idea, Lisa, how long it lasted, I really don't know still the details of all of that. But during the surgery, a doctor came out and they were giving him updates. And a doctor said to him, I don't know how to I don't know how to say this to you, but I feel like God is in the room with your wife. And that doctor goes back to continue to work on me and my son. And a nurse comes out a little while later and tells him, again, I don't know how to describe this to you, but I feel like your wife's body is surrounded by angels all around her bed. It just, it's still four years later, it will always, I mean, my heart is pounding telling you because it's the most incredible experience I could have ever had. And I, I want to share with your viewers and your listeners that I was not wearing a cross. My husband, I went into the hospital knowing that I was going to have to change. And usually the first thing they say is take off all of your jewelry and give it to whoever's with you. There was nothing to identify me as someone or my husband as someone who, oh, let's tell them this. Let's, 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 you know, this will comfort them. no. This was real and true. And and the Holy Spirit is why I was so calm. I feel that so, 
There is no doubt in my mind that the Holy Spirit came to me at that time to protect me and to keep me calm. And in fact, um, in postpartum, I had been uh, in my room and the nurse that was there and took care of me at that time came to see me. And she said, Caitlin, when we, after we were done with your surgery, us nurses, we went outside and we were screaming because it had been so traumatic for us. And she said, but the thing is, we all went outside and screamed and we just couldn't believe how calm you were. And she said, you know, and again, Lisa, you know this as well as I do, that unfortunately, I'm not the only situation where there will be risk to maternal and, and the child's health. They've seen this before, of course, but she said, we always have mothers that are, they're screaming. We usually have to hold them down. Sometimes we tie them down, but we couldn't believe how peaceful you were. It was so unusual for us to see someone so peaceful. And I would love to take credit for that and tell you that my husband sometimes he'll be like, oh, you were the mama bear. You knew that if you were calm, it could create a better outcome. I said, no, thank you for flattering me, but that is not true. It was 100%. God coming to my aid in that moment and creating that peace and that calm. And I still think about it. And I'm like, I was 31 years old and I surrendered my life. And this child that I wanted desperately, I was ready to, to just say, you can take him. And it's still, the story still amazes me. I think it'll amaze me forever. And I don't want that feeling to ever go away because I have always believed in God. But to feel him in such a, I want to say tangible, a, I feel, feel him through this story. Oh, I love this so much, Caitlin. Just to everybody listening, we are going to talk much more about what Caitlin learned and some, you know, some life lessons and beautiful principles when we come back from our sponsor break. But just want to emphasize, some of you out there have had an experience of God taking over, of there being unexplained peace or courage or focus or an answer for a loved one at a desperate moment. Mm -hmm. We know He's here. We know our guardian angels are all around us. So I just want you all, you know, I'm just asking the Lord to help you all to just know that and feel his love in this moment, because what we're talking about is in the realm of the miraculous. Mm -hmm. and the, it's beyond us. We're, we're part of him. He loves us more than we can imagine. And so this is part of what we want to pass on to our children as well. So we're going to be back in just a moment after our sponsor break with more from Caitlin Zara talking about the unexpected homeschooler. We will be right back. Hi, I'm Walter Crawford. And I'm Maureen Whitman. We are the co-founders of homeschoolconnections.com and proud sponsors of the Homeschooling Saints podcast. Which is here to help you homeschool more joyfully, more easily, and more effectively. We want to thank you for listening. And we invite you to check out our courses at homeschoolconnections.com. And now, back to our program. All right, we're back, everybody, with Caitlin Zara, the unexpected homeschooler. And um, we just heard your uh, very traumatic but extraordinarily grace-filled birth story of your second son, Romeo. And just say a little bit, we'll get more deeply into principles and, and, and lots of things that you've learned, but how did this experience become a little bit of a tool for you in discerning forward into homeschooling? Did. And it is very easy to say that I could have had this profound experience and then kind of jump back into normal, busy motherhood and life. But that has so, it has affected me in every way. And the act of surrender, when I tell people that story, they are amazed that I was able to surrender at that time. And again, I take no credit for it. But the real lesson is about our surrender every single day, submitting to his will over and over and over, not just in this time of truly life or death, but now I've got to make this decision about my kid's education and I can't do it alone. And if I can use those same, I don't know, not principles, but use that same emotion-filled surrender in my prayer intentionally, then that is going to really it will always lead to my greatest good. I always, I've shared this with you, Lisa. Something that I tell people all the time is God is always working towards our greatest good. And so I felt at that time 
that I was, what? I've got the school right next door, but there's COVID lockdowns. And I, I had major decisions to make about my son's health and uh, all these roadblocks. And I could say to myself, well, this is all going wrong. God, you have forsaken. Where are you? This is not what I planned. Don't you want the best for me? Instead, I saw God's goodness through this. And I, I think it's just so important to say that God gave us all free will. And so I could have heard in, uh, you know, through prayer and surrender that that is what he wanted for my family. And I still could have turned the other way and said, you know what? It's, it's not what I thought we would have. So let me just do it my way. And I am so thankful that that the answer to my prayers was just so clear and that he gave me, I mean, that's again, the God-given ability to actually accept the message that he was sending. Yeah. And so step us into maybe one or two experiences where God, you know, definitely worked some of that connective yeah. action in your life because you were in the spirit of surrender. You couldn't shake it. You couldn't Definitely. forget it. I was. And I had known at this point, I knew zero homeschoolers. I knew <laughs> no one who had ever done it. I had no social media. I still don't have any social media. I had no way to connect with anyone. And I was really alone. I felt really alone. And so uh, I, I just can't stress enough the power of an intentional prayer, not just should I homeschool or tell me if I should show it to me. I, I tried to have the most intentional, um, specific prayers. Um, and the, the thing that I really needed first and foremost was community. Well, someone's got to show me how to do this. I can look it up online, but there's not much there. I, I have to talk to someone. And so I asked for that. That was the first thing that I asked for. And again, where I live, I, I didn't think I'd find anyone. And I had shared with my chiropractor that I was considering this and I was anxious. It was probably showed in my body how anxious I was. And, um, my husband went to visit her. And as he's leaving his appointment, someone else is coming in and she looked at both of them and said, exchange phone numbers. You two are going to need to talk. I ended up, my husband brought me her number. I called her. We spoke for over an hour and I thought, wow, she really understands. She thinks just like me. She's, this is, this is amazing. And near the end of our conversation, she said that she had enrolled her son in a program, a homeschool program. And that, oh wait, she's looking, oh wait. They have an open house. It's tomorrow night. <laughs> and she said, wait, give me a second. Give me a second. I hear her tap it on her phone. And she's like, they still have a few spots left for enrollment to go and, and sit tomorrow night. And less than 24 hours later, I was in a cafeteria of people facing the same exact hardship, I, adverse, whatever you want to call it, whatever was stressing me, whatever I thought were my roadblocks, they were shared roadblocks. And there it was, a cafeteria full of community. Just as I had asked, it just appeared. And I think that was, it happened so quickly that after that, I was like, I got to keep praying for all the things. I, I mean, I got to keep doing this. This is, uh, it was just, <laughs> I felt it's not the right word, but I just want to be genuine. It felt like it was pure magic. And that is what Jesus is in miracles. It, it just, it was so incredible to see that when I asked with such an honest, pure, humble heart, it was delivered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we worry about that, right? We're all so hard on ourselves. We think, I can't ask with a pure, honest, humble heart. But again, the Holy Spirit is right there. Even, was it St. Paul who said he teaches us to pray when we haven't got words, even? Yeah, uh, definitely. Like, and I yeah. think now, Lisa, I, your viewers will hear this, but uh, you know, you and I had spoken about this once before, and I shared a quote that kind of Really, it's my my favorite, favorite, favorite. And I, I seem to paraphrase it a lot, but I wrote it down for our conversation today. And it was, blessed is the crisis that made you grow, the fall that made you look to heaven, and the problem that made you look for God. And that's St. Padre Pio. And my goodness, these two situations in my life, to bridge them together, you know, this traumatic birth where I could have lost my life, could have lost my son. And then this idea of what am I, how are my kids going to go to school? Am I uprooting my life? Both of them felt very tragic to me. And both of them, instead of turning me away from God, have just pointed my eyes right to him. And so blessed is absolutely the crisis that made you look towards God in your faith. And I just love that quote so much that I just, I wanted to share it with you again and share it with everybody listening 
Yeah, and I appreciate that so much because none of us wants to suffer or have a crisis or be in that moment of profound questioning. We want life to go smoothly and comfortably. Yeah. And and at least for listeners in the United States, most of us are accustomed to life being pretty soft. Yeah. But but there are a lot of people who homeschool because their children are special needs or mm -hmm. because their family has faced some kind of a crisis. Maybe yes. mom or dad is chronically ill. Mm -hmm. There are so many unique stories about how blessed we become. In fact, when I was giving my conversion testimony a lot several years ago, I was on the road yeah. a lot for a while. Um, one of the things I always said that I is that if you scratch the surface of the story of any person who's at daily mass or a daily rosary person, you mm -hmm. almost always find a story of suffering yeah. that ignited a profound love for God, a dependency on God that set them free. And that's why they run like lovers to the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really extraordinary. It is frightening to suffer. I mean, even Jesus said, let this cup pass. But what what else, out of all of this, some of the other lessons that you've learned in uh, terms of the day-to-day, -day, the lifestyle, yeah. what are you so seeing? Much. The fruits, yeah. Yes, yeah, so much. I don't mean to interrupt you, but I'm excited oh, to tell all. you. I just think <laughs> I would not have, without those two experiences specifically, in addition to that time, I said my son was born March 5th, 2020, with COVID lockdowns, with threats of, you know, um, unemployment, all different things. Those hardships were exactly what drew me to also raise my children with more faith than maybe I otherwise would have. And I shared with you that I'm raising my two sons, I say, with the armor of God, because I just think I have experienced things now that felt extremely difficult, extremely traumatic. And I want so much for that armor of God to be what they turn to when they have things that are inevitably going to happen in their lives. And like a lot of us, we worry for our country and for the world, and nobody knows what tomorrow holds for us personally or globally. And I just want them to have their toolbox filled with prayer and with comfort in, in God's goodness. And I want that for them so badly. So that's a major takeaway of how it's affected my daily life, how I'm raising my children. Um, and I just think it's refined me. I think that as much as this was about educating my children in this way and giving them this childhood and this education, God was totally working on me as a person as well. And I am enjoying it. I'm so fulfilled. I am so happy for the people I have met, so many wonderful people I've met through this experience. But certainly it's opened more doors for me than I could have imagined and just changed me. I don't know exactly how to articulate how it's changed me, but motherhood is not, it's not what I learned in school. I, uh, education, home education, I will say, is not, homeschooling is not what I learned in school. It is not what I did in the classroom. It is an extension of motherhood. And I had to humble myself to forget what I spent six years learning at, at college and in my master's and dig into how I can serve my family more and more. And that's all I, that's really what we all want for our lives. I think as mothers, that's our number one thing. And I've been given such a gift to be able to do that now. Yeah, incredible. Amazing the way God knows us so well. So and knows how to prepare us. Um, what do you do when you're faced with negativity about your choice to homeschool? Well, that happens a lot, especially, again, I hate to say go, to go back to it, but I am the unexpected homeschooler right outside of Manhattan. It's foreign. It's unusual to people. And a lot of people still will say to me, um, well, he's getting, your older one is getting older now. He's in second grade. So you're going to give this up soon, right? Or what, you know, why do you do that? Are you going to, but are you soon going to switch over and go back to public school? I get a lot of these comments all the time, wherever I am, whenever it comes up. And I do feel like in those moments, it is very tempting to say, oh, the devil is working. He is trying to pull away my joy for what I do. And I, I'm, I'm meant to felt, feel self-conscious or to feel bad about what I'm doing or, oh, I'm embarrassed. But no, I have to refocus on the fact that if God is with me, nobody nobody can take me down. This is what he, his will for our lives is. And when people do say that, I don't have it in me to kind of give it back to people. That's just not who I am. But I usually tell people, my son is happy and he's thriving and I'm happy and I'm thriving. So as long as that is our situation, we are going to keep doing this and enjoying it. And I will tell you, Lisa, 10 out of 10 times, people just say, okay, 
cool and leave it at that. So (laughs) that's usually my answer, but I do hear it a lot and it isn't easy. It would be really nice for people to say, oh, that's so wonderful. But Again, that is God leading me on this path and saying, no, no, fight that temptation to feel embarrassed about it. You're doing the right thing. Come back to me. Come back to why you love this. And I do. I keep finding the strength. I have to pick myself up and find the strength every time someone says something, but I do. Yeah, so beautiful. So as we're just kind of wrapping up for today, and we definitely want to have you back, Caitlin, there's so many more things I want to talk with you about, and this has just been such a joy. Um, What final thoughts are coming to you that you'd like to leave our listeners with today? Oh, I could keep going forever. It's a tough one. I I just, I, I hope that someone who's listening to this and has it on their heart that maybe there's that little glimmer that I had of, okay, maybe this could be the right decision, that they continue to explore it, that they use a really clear, specific, intentional prayer, asking like I did for community, ask for what it is that you need, and I'm sure that they will find it. And so really, that's what I'd want to leave somebody with. If you feel at all called to do this, email me. I I can be your first sense of community, that's for sure. But really, just stay prayerful and let the anxiety go because I wasted a lot of time being anxious about it. And I just needed to say, I can't do this alone. Lord, help me. Beautiful. All right. Caitlin Zara, the unexpected homeschooler. Thank you so much for being with us today. (laughs) What a joy. Everybody, thanks for listening. We appreciate you. We pray for you. Please pray for us too. God bless you and have a beautiful day in the Lord. And that's our show for today. Our program is sponsored by homeschoolconnections.com. Be sure to subscribe to Homeschooling Saints and leave us an honest review. God bless you and thank you for joining us.